Hello, welcome back. Uh, prepared another lesson for you during this Lenten season. Uh, I want to remind you that as dry and luxury as this is, it was intended to be in class setting where there's a little bit more interaction. And that can still take place. Even though we're isolating ourselves, we can still reach out with a phone or a text or an email. Uh, and so if I ask some questions that, that trigger a thought, uh, I encourage you to go ahead and think about it with someone else. Uh, you either invite someone else to watch and, and come up with some answers of their own or just ask the question of someone else. So as we go through these readings in the Psalms and Bishop Lewis's book, uh, don't keep it to yourself. Uh, even as we remove ourselves from each other's physical uh, company, uh, go ahead and reach out through the text or the email or the phone and share some of these thoughts with someone else. Again, I will open up with a prayer that Bishop Lewis has provided, and I invite you to uh, enter into a prayerful state yourself. Lord, oh, how we praise you for being the Lord of the oppressed, who cares for the needy, the homeless, the prisoners, the sick, the scared. Bless this time of study, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Amen. The first reading we will look at uh, at this time will be Psalm 146. Uh, but before I read that psalm, I want to share a little bit of Bishop Lewis's thoughts. She says, When you examine the Bible, the most common Hebrew words for praise are halal and tehillal. Halal being, of course, a variation of where we get hallelujah. In both the Old and New Testament, praise is most often oriented toward God. Praise is a natural and necessary response to fully enjoy the object that is praised. The word praise itself comes from a Latin word meaning value or price. To give praise to God is to proclaim God's merit or worth. Praise is an act of worship. Our praise towards God is the vehicle by which we express our joy to the Lord. There are several ways to praise God. Praising God may be individual, collective, spontaneous, spontaneous, or arranged in a song or prayer formation. So, first question to think about with someone else. Sometimes we go to worship to learn. Sometimes we go to be comforted. Sometimes we go to praise. How do you most enjoy offering praise? All right. While you're thinking about that, I will go ahead and turn to Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God all my life long. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortals, in whom there is no help. When their breath departs, they return to the earth, and on that very day, their plans perish. Happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He upholds the orphan and the widow. But the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. All right, let's hear a little bit more from Bishop Lewis. The psalmist opens and then closes his psalm with praise the Lord. The psalmist depicts God as our only real source of help and deliverance. In verses 5 through 9, the psalmist depicts God as the faithful God, who works for the oppressed, helps the needy, frees the prisoner, loves the righteous. 
heals the infirm, watches over the alien, sustains the helpless, and frustrates the ways of the wicked. Finally, the psalmist reminds us that the Lord is sovereign. God has no allegiance. God is always by our side, rooting for each of us. What does it mean that praising God is a constant attitude? How does one praise at all times? And then a fun question, what is your favorite praise song? Your favorite hymn? Mine is How Great Thou Art. I sometimes get that sense of awe and wonder when I sing that, the way many people do with Amazing Grace, or It Is Well With My Soul. Um, but what's yours? And again, ask a friend. Praise. As we go through the Lenten season, how can we best not make it a season of just gloom and doom and mortality and death, but of praise for how God answers that sense of mortality? Next, Bishop Lewis invites us to look at the Gospel according to Luke, part of the Christmas story as we contemplate uh, Mary. I'm going to be looking at Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. 1, 26 through 38. The sixth month. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And the angel then departed from her. All right. The Greek word for favor means benefits and special honor. When God has favor upon your life, you should expect the impossible. Society teaches us that influence is not what you know, but who you know. Bishop Lewis says that she has come to realize in life that she would rather have favor with God than influence with humanity. When God has favor upon your life, doors will open wide with opportunity. Where have you found favor in these last few troubling weeks? It's easy enough to find the obstacles. It's easy enough to find the difficulties. But if you look carefully, have you also found evidence of God's love and favor? It's there. And once again, I invite you to ponder this with someone else. Ask the question of yourself, where has God been, even in the midst of these difficulties, 
and then reach out to someone else and allow them to share with you as well. As the mother of Jesus, Mary believed and obeyed. Believing the message from the angel, she considered it a blessing to carry the child conceived by the Holy Spirit. We can learn a valuable lesson from her faithfulness. Mary was willing to be available to God. She could have resisted and complained, but instead she accepted her role. This young girl was faithful to the task. If you can see it with your natural eyes, then it's not really faith. The Bible records in Hebrews chapter 11, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Faith is central to all of life. Faith impacts how we live and walk with God. Faith enables us to please God. According to Webster's Dictionary, impossible means hopeless, incapable of being done, unacceptable, unattainable, unachievable. However, when my inabilities merge with God's divine capabilities, anything truly is possible. How does faithfulness and the ability to experience God's favor walk hand in hand. The one makes the other more attainable, more achievable. By faith, we are more readily able to experience God's favor, to see God's presence in our lives. And so again, during this Lenten journey, as we focus on our shortcomings, one of the answers to those shortcomings is God's Holy Spirit in our lives and a faithfulness to accept that and to walk in faith forward. Old Testament reading, Ezekiel. I'll be reading from chapter 1. Chapter 1, 1 through 3, and then chapter 2. Ezekiel 1, 1 through 3, and then jumping to chapter 2. In the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the exiles by the river Kebar, the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiakim. the word of the Lord came to the priest Ezekiel, son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kabar, and the hand of the Lord was on him there. Chapter 2, verse 8. But you, mortal, hear what I say to you. Do not be rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. I looked. And a hand was stretched out to me, and a written scroll was in it. He spread it before me. It had writing on the front and on the back. And written on it were words of lamentation and mourning and woe. He said to me, O mortal, eat what is offered to you. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he gave me the scroll to eat. He said to me, Mortal, eat this scroll that I give you and fill your stomach with it. And then I ate it. And in my mouth, it was as sweet as honey. Lent is in a, a journey of exploration. As we come to more fully understand our mortality, our shortcomings, hopefully we can also come to understand our own calling to address that and move forward. So this is a passage about calling. Bishop Lewis writes, are you willing to trust, obey, and go where God's will leads you? Do you feel that God has a special purpose for your life? 
Dr. Norman Habel, an Old Testament scholar, believes that a call is a summons by God to carry out a particular function. Habel believes that there are four stages in a divine call that are commonly displayed throughout the biblical stories. And he suggests that the call upon our lives has a direct correlation to these four stages. He believes that first, there's a divine confrontation by God, a small voice, a dream, an unction of the Holy Spirit, a gut feeling that the Holy Spirit is leading you to do something. Then sometimes there's a rejection of that call where you wrestle. Are you sure, God? Is it me you want? Do you want me to do this? Where you wrestle with what God has asked of you, has revealed to you. Then there's the assurance that God will be with you always. And finally, there's an acceptance of the call, which leads to various responses. Is there a difference between what God might have called, called you to do with your life versus what God might have called you to do today, this week, at this specific time in our nation, in our world's history? Does call have to mean mission work in Haiti? What might God be calling you to do in this time of isolation and quarantine? Because obviously the answer is no, you don't necessarily have to go to Russia or China or Haiti. Sometimes your call is to be encourager. Sometimes your call is to be supporter. The phone call, the text, the email might make a big difference in someone's life. And the call changes. That which what you were supposed to do when you were in your 20s or your 30s might not be what God requires of you in your 50s or your 60s. And so we must never stop asking that question. And call is what enables us to move through troubling times. One response to difficulties and obstacles in difficult times is call. Taking one step, and then another, and then another. And so we're all invited to ask the question, what is God asking of you today, this week, this month? Because the first question that she asks, Do you feel that God has a special purpose for your life? Well, the church believes that the answer is always going to be yes. God does have a special purpose for you. Different than he has for me or someone else. But there nonetheless. And so part of our Lenten journey is exploring how we can move through this season to better respond to God's saving act in Jesus Christ on Good Friday and on Easter. Not just accepting it and then going back to our room, back to our home, but accepting it and moving forward, firm in the belief that we're one of God's servants. We've got one more to look at, and this will hopefully give you plenty to think about in the, in the coming week. Uh, and again, we're going to turn to the Psalms. Uh, Psalm 130. Uh, Psalm 130 is usually categorized as an individual lament or a complaint or a prayer for help. Things are bad, Lord. When are you going to help? I'm troubled, Lord. Where are you going to be to help? So Psalm 130. Out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. More than those who watch for the morning. O oh, Israel, hope in the Lord 
For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. Psalm 130. So a prayer of lament. And in verse 3, O Lord, you should mark iniquities. Who could stand? There's a hint that the psalmist may recognize his or her own sinfulness, the iniquities, as cause for whatever calamity or crisis or concern that they might have. And then, as they credit their own iniquities, they also give thanks for God's forgiveness. O oh Lord, if you keep track of all my sins, what can we do about it? But verse 4, but there is forgiveness. And again, in Lent, this is a season for really confronting within ourselves that which keeps us from God. Uh, in seminary, uh, one of the definitions for sin that really struck with me, in a capital S sin, not sins, all the different actions and thoughts and behaviors, but capital S sin, what the definition that was given to me was that which does not please God, that which is opposite of God's will. Anything that is opposing God or God's will is sin. And then we can list sin small as all those ways in which we turn from God, away from God. So this is another opportunity for really confronting within ourselves the ways in which we turn from God in our thoughts and our actions. Specifically, however, we also have the chance to look not just in the generic, big picture sin, but specifics. How is this current health crisis, how in this current health crisis have we been less than helpful, less than faithful, less than responsible? Sometimes we, we confess our sins and we've gotten used to it, the sin of envy or laziness or that, but without getting specific. Lent encourages us to get specific. How have we been lazy or envious? How have we expressed a lack of hope or faithfulness or responsibility to our neighbor? As we thank God for forgiveness, how do we do so without returning to the very thoughts and behaviors that required our repentance in the first place? The reason confession was a sacramental aspect of our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters, was that it enabled moving forward from them. Confession was necessary for forgiveness and not taken for granted. So Lent is our Protestant answer to really seek it within ourselves those specific ways in which we have not been faithful to God so that we can accept God's forgiveness and move forward. Closing thoughts from Bishop Lewis. In Acts chapter 17, Luke states that God commands all people everywhere to repent. Luke chapter 13 reveals, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. No one is exempt from repenting. All must respond to God with repentance. Paul writes in his letter to the Corinthians, the second letter, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. Finally, Matthew chapter 1 tells us the Messiah will come to save his people from their sins. In Psalm 130, which we just read, waiting with watchfulness is declared by the psalmist. And the psalm ends with verses 7 and 8 with an appeal for the entire community to have hope in the Lord as the loving Redeemer. And again, to bring it forward to this time and this place, to have hope that these troubled times also will pass and that God has nothing but our best in mind. Go in peace, and I hope this has been helpful. Amen.